All right, so now we're moving on to the part in grief where we just want to be quiet. And sometimes you just want to be by yourself and be quiet. I don't want to be where there's a lots of there is lots of talk or noise. All profound things and emotions of things are preceded and attended by silence. While working through our grief, we are likely to want to be quiet to keep ourselves uh, much of the time to mull over, to keep to ourselves at most times to mull over our innermost thoughts and desires to avoid superficial conversation. This silent period enables us to explore ways that we think and feel about loss. It allows us to think about ourselves and what we need to wish and hope for. In a way, this period of silence acts as kind of a restful absorption of our feelings and our energies. It can serve as well as a period of growth during which we examine our relationships to our loved ones and then center ourselves and determine how to go forward, how to emerge from our cocoon of sadness so that we may function in the world. And that's that's easier said than done. Even after the contemplation and everything that you go through and the, and the withdrawal feeling that you may have because of grief, um, it's like you want someone around yet you don't want anyone around it's like hug me and let go i want you to stay here but yet go away simultaneously at the same time we need to recognize that silence that is prolonged silence that becomes a, a way of life is not good and although we need to give ourselves time to be quiet and introspective it would be unwise and unhealthy to let such a period go on indefinitely now, I didn't let it go on to that point. Uh, hey, what's going on, big baby? Uh, what's going on, everybody? Hey, Denise. Uh, Jess. All right. Uh, my silence is a time for listening to myself, for enjoying calm, for centering on my innermost thoughts, needs, and desires. I will think of silence as a meadow in my mind where I can step out and enjoy the privacy and beauty that it offers when I'm alone I just keep reviewing the same things now this is really true uh, that's why I hopped on today hello KG Cooper what's going on uh, just say sissy when one is alone imperfection must be endured every minute of the day because we sit back and we basically think about all the stuff that we could do better or all the things that we think we could have went about differently things we could have fixed we try to bargain Especially with death, like maybe if I had been there earlier, if I had come home sooner, I could have been there to, you know, call the ambulance. Or if I hadn't went out of town, I could have been there to uh, somehow fix the situation at hand. And you come up with a thousand reasons why you could have done something differently to fix the situation. When in actuality, if they were going to go, they were going to go anyway. You feel me? So... Solitude has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. We can be plagued by thoughts that will not leave us alone. Images that we view over and over. You know, like seeing uh, my mom on the floor with her mouth open when she died. You know what I'm saying? Like, or seeing my dad on the floor in the bathroom, the hallway, when he died. You know, these images randomly pop up in your mind like a post-traumatic stress syndrome, sometimes subconsciously in your dreams, they will come up. Um, sometimes you'll relive finding out the news about the loved one in dreams, and it seems so real to the point that you wake up crying, you know what I'm saying, feeling very vulnerable, feeling very scared. Like even tonight, like there was a nauseating feeling, not was, is, I'm still kind of nauseated, had a really good dinner, um, but it's not the food. The nausea that I feel is not the food. It's not, I ate something bad. It's a feeling of whatever's going on in the world right now, there is an uneasiness. I don't know if I'm the only one who can feel it, but it just seems like something, it's not just off, but on top of the grief, on top of the misfortune, on top of all of the things going on in our personal lives and in our businesses, some churches, uh, there's a nausea 
You can't feel good about what's going on right now. It's a, I feel nauseated. It's a, I'm unsettled like I know something great and terrible is about to happen. <sighs> Grief is not just death related, you guys. It's, um, we're grieving the life we used to have. <sighs> we're grieving the normalcies and things that we took for granted. <sighs> we're grieving not being able to breathe um, without wearing masks in public or joining together in some type of way or fellowshipping in some type of way. So on top of whatever you're feeling because of the loss, whether it's COVID related or unrelated, some of the feelings that we're feeling have nothing to do with people who died of COVID. It's just things we're going through in our personal lives and then certain personal tragedies or griefs, grieving, uh, grieving over past situations um, which get triggered by the current state of the world. The loneliness is the isolation when you're by yourself. And uh, well, this is a new normal. I don't know if there's anything that's necessarily normal now. It was weird because when I went to uh, every state is different as far as their restaurants stuff is concerned. Some still allow indoor, some only allow outdoor. But I know New York and California, they aren't allowing that right now. So even though this particular establishment was supposed to close or was listed as being closed uh, at nine, the the host uh, was saying that it closes at 8.30 instead. And it's like, well, then you probably should update your site. So uh, she's like, well, we have to close early because we have to be able to pay people and we have no customers. So we have to close a half hour early, but I still made it. You know what I'm saying? So um, make one question. What is normal? What was normal? Uh, normal was more like just being able to do basic things without having to rethink before you leave the house. Oh, shit. I forgot my mask. That kind of stuff. Or, you know, I feel like I want to have fun today. Well, I can't go have fun today because I can't I can't go anywhere. I can go somewhere, but I can't go to places I want to go. I can eat, but I can't eat the things that I like to eat or places that you know, favorite establishments. And even when they reopen, it was like there was a time I can sit inside to eat this. I didn't have to deal with the, the natural elements of outdoors and still try to have a good time or have a nice conversation without in the back of my head is this the last time I'll be able to eat this way or is this the last time I'll be able to go about uh, it's a nauseating feeling knowing that we don't have answers we don't have leadership At least not the type of leadership that in a crisis you would love to have comfort in being able to uh, lean, lean on or get advice from or get uh, grounded wisdom or counsel from. It is difficult that it's so difficult that we grieve more than just someone dying. It's like I'm grieving my former way of life is nothing was really normal for me after my grandparents died, let alone when my parents died. After that, your old world, all your holidays change. All the, the days that mean something important to you concerning them. You, you find a way over the years to uh, find a better way, an altern alternative way to try to face those things. Um, it just feels like everybody, like you said, woman of jazz, 
everyone's fending for themselves no money um not all of us some of us you know still have our jobs and are doing quite well i'm fortunate where i'm independent so i'm not signed to a record label i have my own label i have employees um i'm able to send and you know provide for other households and that's a good feeling but how long can that go on there's only so much i can do uh as an employer because there's no guarantee that even the employers will be employed at this point it's because it's not getting better it's it's slowly getting worse so even though i know we have biden and miss harris mrs harris i i'm relieved i am grateful that we, we don't at least have to deal with what we've been dealing with you know we only have a little while longer to deal with that part but i still feel no more confident or secure with a positive outcome as a result of all of this what's up kg um i try to do the same as vicky but the worst is seeing people ignoring what's happening and bringing risk for others without any empathy this is very good i know the feeling and nighttime makes it low-key worse you got to keep your mind busy yes in these hours i was so i wasn't necessarily disturbed but every place i tried to turn to to get some type of relief everybody was busy and so when everybody else is too busy for me and they don't mean no arms like people got things going on i get it i sometimes people call me they can't get a hold of me i get it but you have folks that are like hey call me hit me up whenever blah 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 and then you try to do that and it's like they're not available <laughs> so you know you have to figure out a way to keep your mind on a on a positive vibe when i do these lives you guys i do it for the people who need to hear it at that time everything that i say is not necessarily even though people can screen record and you know i can't control any of those things but if i'm not putting it up on my igtv i don't understand why people take content that's coming from a real place to try to help people unless i'm putting it out there to be exploited in that way or to be useful in a particular way I don't take well to people taking my pain and trying to make money off it with their cash apps and putting it on stuff without even asking me or tagging me on these things or using my previous moniker to market something knowing it'll get clickbait. So I think that was one of the first triggers for me tonight uh, was just seeing people take my life and my story and use it so they can increase their subscribers. Yes, people may have been blessed by it, but it's still one of those things that when I hop on here, I'm really checking in with people that fuck with me. I'm not checking in with people who want to exploit me further. If I'm already putting myself out here, going through the process of grief, sharing my teaching from my experience, reading from other people's teaching and writings and experience and applying it to myself. You know, I didn't say I wrote this book and I'm teaching from here. I told you where the book comes from. It's a, a time to grieve. This is someone else's work. I'm just reading, going through it, hopefully sharing it with you. But I'm not taking credit as if I wrote the book and then selling this as if this knowledge is my own to participate in or to gather from. It's for a group of people who couldn't sleep either. It's for a group of people who also are concerned. Um, and I don't, I'm, if I'm telling you... <laughs> The live I did last night, I was talking about the exploitation and the use and people trying to tie me into things. And for those of you who know, it was like I didn't get on here yet last night to talk about the Walls scandal or their Walls scandal. I didn't, he, he, you know, Beachley Tone finally responds to Dare. I, that's not what that live is about. But the way you're putting it out there is as if. That was the whole premise of why I was talking about the live. The live was about grief and injustices and my experiences. Uh, Adam, it looks like this. A time to grieve. Um, 
it was, I don't like when things are taken out of context and edited for clickbait to get subscribers for your page. And we don't even have a relationship like that. And if we did, you would at least ask me, hey, is it okay if, um, you know, can I use this? I like something that you said resonated with me. Can I put this on my page or not? I feel like um, if you ask me, and I see in what way you're trying to use it, then okay. But just to take it upon yourself to try to just take the pieces you want that you know is a hot subject matter right now to use it to bring people to your page. And I, and I had nothing to do with it. You didn't tag me. So it's just like, okay, well, next time, <laughs> could you at least ask before you try to exploit my pain for your game? Even if you're trying to share it you're saying for good reason the premise of how you're sharing it is not the truth of where it came from and it's a violation i agree and so i'm not one that likes that i already told you i shared stuff about my mom how she died the things i had to do before she died that was specifically for people who happened to tune in live that probably follow me you know and want the best for me and know what spirit i'm coming from not for that information just to be shared without my permission to the rest of the world because I already know what they're going to do with it. You know, I can't control what happens, but at least the people who I know are on these lives this late, either something's on your mind or you like the way I'm delivering it or you're going through something similar in grief and you're trying to find a way to get through this time and your grief with someone who you feel comfortable with. And that's basically why I do this it's hard to explain it's almost as if I'm ashamed of death I had what I see wait a minute I had what I see can go with total bereavement a sense of dis in disfigurement mortification disgrace definitely I felt the disfigurement before since Troy died last Wednesday, I certainly feel mortified because, like I said, my appetite is still just now kind of getting back to normal. You feel me? Like, I'm still not okay. I I still wasn't as hungry as I could have been tonight because my, my spirit, it's so fresh and I'm still trying to, like, deal with other grief on top of the fresh grief. You know, I'm not happy about Rance Allen passing away. You know, that's the last thing I thought would be happening. This is someone I look up to. My dad raised me on, you know, whatnot. And, you know, these heroes that, you know, mean a lot to you when they pass away. Like when Chad passed away, um, Black Panther, it affected me as if, you know, we had a long running relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like we're friends or something. This is like the homie. And no I didn't know him like that but it felt like I did when he died I'm still not over Kobe the way Kobe died the way his daughter died the way the other people passed away as well but more so more so Kobe because I was at church when it happened Bishop um, Jones called me into his office I thought he needed me to do um, something like I don't know a song or an errand or whatever it is that he you know my pastor needs me to do that's within my power to do you know I make myself available to do that and try to do it with excellence you know with a good heart with a, a, a spirit of excellence and a spirit of like hey look at who I'm representing let me get out here and make it happen but all he was telling me was I have some awful news and then he explained to me what had happened to Kobe then I looked at him having to contemplate how to relay this between first service and second service to the congregation. Because at that time, COVID hadn't hit yet. At least it had started, but it was so far away. We thought it had nothing to do with us at that time. I remember that clearly. I'm still grieving when he had to announce that Kobe had died in that helicopter crash. The way the congregation collectively let out this horrible sound. And just how devastated the con the congregation was at the news. So I'm still I'm still grieving 
taken in that information we've experienced a lot uh, in a very short period of time I try not to make it about just my experiences it's just as a, a counterpoint reference for so you know I'm not just describing something to you that I'm thinking about or I've studied I, I can only speak from what I've been through And hopefully saying maybe by sharing that I share that share that feeling with you in some way, even if, even though I may have never met you, I still feel like when I hop on here, I'm a little bit less alone. Um, and I appreciate y'all for giving me the confidence to be able to share my feelings and navigate such a private thing it's still private to me even though I'm on here publicly I still feel like I'm only talking to those who I'm talking to that get my heart and in, in what I'm saying to you I'm still in denial about Aaliyah's passing me too I was at the Potter's house when I found that out I was really scared because a couple of my uh, well one is a really good friend but another is, was the son of my dad's best friend uh, Rapture Stewart and uh, Eric Seats had produced Rock the Boat so when I heard that the, the uh, plane had crashed I just remember Sput throwing his keys on the ground saying nah you gotta be kidding me and then he told me what happened and I immediately thought about Rapture and um, Eric Seats thinking that because they had produced the song that maybe they had went to the video shoot. And I remember feeling very concerned. My stomach dropped. Everybody was in shock. And if you remember, not too long after that, maybe um, a few weeks later, a few days later, a few weeks later, 9-11 happened. And I just remember feeling... Uh, very concerned I was I had just got out of New York after that Potter's House um, gig uh, I was in New York on another gig and we left out of New York I was uh, married at the time and so me and my wife at that time flew back a day before it all happened and I remember the person who was driving us was uh, Palestinian and they were very very angry about whatever was happening with Israel at the time and I guess whatever had happened to his family as a result of uh, whatever war whatever was happening whatever conflicts was happening in 2001 at that time September 10th is when our taxi driver was very irate, very upset about them. And the next, the next day, 9/11 uh, happened, and I remember being in that taxi, still thinking about Aaliyah at the time. That was still on my my mind. We got home and missed that particular situation, thank God. But the next day, when I woke up, we saw the actual second plane hit. I'm still traumatized by watching the second plane go in. Uh, yeah, it's a long time ago. I went to New York since then, uh, obviously. Uh, but you can still feel it. I went to Ground Zero. You know, they rebuilt and everything, but I remember seeing that second plane go in. I remember seeing people jumping out the windows And dying to their, you know, falling to their death. Uh, I just remember how everybody was screaming when that second plane went into that that tower. Just the horrific screams. Uh, so I called my dad. I said he was living at that time. I said, Dad, yo, is this it? I said, Pop. 
level with me because I was at that point where I was like, you know what, this might be it because if they pl- crashed a plane into the wo- two planes into the World Trade Center, we either going into like World War Three or some type of nuclear situation or something really, really bad is about to happen. I remember feeling like very uneasy when that happened. And here I am, uh, um, 20 years later next year, still nauseated, still upset about what happened. And then when those buildings collapsed and I knew that there were people still inside of there with families I remember Dan Rather going on like Letterman or something like that and him just talking about it and then him, you know, breaking down and crying. His humanity, I still love Dan Rather. Thank God for him. I knew it was real because I'd never seen Dan Rather cry. These types of things stay with you. They never leave. So I have that same feeling again now. That's what I said all that to say. The nauseating feeling I had when I found about Kobe and how the church was screaming. The same way I felt when uh, Leah passed. Because, you know, two people who were on that plane, I was just in a limousine with going to the Soul Train Music Awards. You know, at that time, they were talking about a possible collaboration that was trying to happen between Janet, you know, and Aaliyah, but they're, they were saying that both of their schedules were just so busy and Janet's album was coming out before Aaliyah's, which was like that summer, like an August album, I think it was, and then Janet came out in April with All For You, and it couldn't get it together. And talking with these two guys in this limousine on my way to the Soul Train Music Awards, I was nominated that year, I think. And then to know, like, weeks later, they were in that plane with her. It just, the same way I was in that limo with them, Something could have happened in that limousine. You know what I mean? It could have. I'm, I, 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 when I when I think of things like this, my mind, because it's just the way my mind works, I'm able to literally put myself in situations based off of a point of contact. So I can go into a room and sense that something has happened bad in that room. So it's it's pretty. At least they called me back. So I'll hit them after this live. So that's a good friend. Thank you, Tony. So it just, it puts things in perspective. That same nauseated feeling is what I have right now. While I'm still navigating, you know, Joy Clark passing away. A week ago today. Or watching that Rockefeller situation and Megan Trainer looking like that <laughs> like a big ass Christmas present. <laughs> Whatever. Um everybody got masks on and you know, everyone's still trying to dance and sing like everything's okay. And I'm just looking at everybody, you know, in the restaurant. I'm looking up at the screen. I'm, I'm looking at people in their masks. I'm looking at the, the restaurant, that, which is probably always full. Um, exceptionally empty. And thinking to myself... It's incredible how humans somehow we're so resilient that we we do find a way to get through very tragic times. I thought the the end of the world was happening when 9/11 happened, but 
It took some time to repair. It will never, never ever heal fully from it, especially those who lived there or had family members that died in those buildings or in those planes. But we got through it. So I'm trying to be optimistic and hopeful while I'm going through personal grief to say the same way I thought that that had to be the end. My dad told me, he says, no, son. No, he didn't say son. He said, no, bub. He said, this is not the end. And I couldn't put it together um, how he was so calm in such a severe situation because he was telling me this right after I saw the plane hit. I was at uh, my uh, apartment home and he was at his home still with my mom who was living also at the time. He was so calm about it. And and my dad used to make me so frustrated, yo, because he knew how to stay calm in, in, in such severe situations, but I... I'm grateful for that calm. I'm grateful for that gravity. I'm grateful for uh, that type of leadership and stability because it really does help to ground you when you are feeling like it's all coming apart, like it's all unraveling. Um, It's one of those things where I'm trying to believe the same way my father told me, hey, this is not the end of the world. Um, we're going to be fine. This is bad, but fret not. And I can see a lot of those, um, As I mature, I look more and more like my father. And I see so much of him in me. He told me <laughs> that someday, because I was making fun of his his stomach one day, <laughs> I was like, I ain't ever going to have, you know, no stomach like that. <sighs> he said, you saying that now, you got that six pack now. He says, but pretty soon you're going to, you're going to have the same thing. <laughs> I was like, Nigga, please, I wish I, I wish I would have a belly. You know, I wish I would be thick like that. At that time, I didn't know we'd be in a quarantine where all I wanted to do was eat. Like, <laughs> and that I'd look in that mirror and I had my own damn kangaroo pooch. <laughs> You know, I'm not ashamed of it or whatever. You know, I took pictures without my shirt on with my stomach, you know, bigger than I remember it ever being. But I just remember there was a time I thought that that was impossible, you know. (laughs) Well, nigga, it's possible. my dad's voice when I moved from San Diego to LA knowing I had to rebrand I had to start over and I had to drive that 26 footer U-Haul by myself I had never handled that type of machinery before I was the baby of the family so you know I was spoiled you know people always look out for me you know what I'm saying they just don't want me to do nothing so hey <laughs> Check the expiration date on the milk. It says May 16th. All right. So, but because they weren't around anymore, my parents weren't around, my dad wasn't around anymore, I had to drive that 26-footer in the rain and in the fog. It was like some type of, so melodramatic, like a damn movie, yo. And I heard my dad saying to me, hey, bub, you got this. Just relax and drive. You can do this. As a man... It was, it, there was no other choice. Had I not taken that step to do something 
to move on. I would not be able to tell you this story with a clear heart and a clear conscience and resilience and compassion. His voice, things he told me, after your parents die, there's things that they say to you while they're living that you, you heard it, but you didn't really hear it. Those lessons become more pronounced after they're gone. So I'm thankful for the foundation that my parents laid. We are soldiers in the army and we have to fight. Although sometimes nigga, we have to cry. It doesn't mean you're weak or you're some type of bitch, pussy, weak ass, jelly back. A real man's tears are majestic. It shows that you have humanity and compassion and because we've been lacking humanity and leadership for so long, I think that's why all of us kind of look to Obama for, even though he's not our president, he's still kind of like a, a guiding light or, or some type of source of comfort, he and his wife. Uh, he wasn't perfect. I'm not trying to put that type of messianic vibe on Obama, but his human decency and swag is just something I think we kind of took for granted for eight years. So I'm grieving that. I'm grieving the embarrassment of a country that with all of what it's worth. I love my country. You feel me? Like I know America can be fucked up. I get it. I'm just looking at its origin and how it started. But I, I do love my country. And I just feel embarrassed that I got friends from other countries calling me like, hey, man, are you guys OK? They know we don't know because we're in it. I remember going to Vienna on tour in Austria. It's my first time. And I was just intrigued where people were riding bikes. They go drinking at a certain time of the day. People just shut down everything and go be with their families. And the majority of what people were about in Vienna was good music, good food, good wine, good sex, and staying out of people's business. The driver that I had, um, she was white, beautiful, white woman. Looked like she was like 28, 29, maybe like 30, but late 20s, early 30s. Beautiful, just beautiful, compassionate spirit. And she was like, we're really praying for you in America. We're so sorry about you living under an authoritarian dictatorship rule and because the way that we've been desensitized to the type of behavior that we've experienced from this type of leadership and this administration we forget just how awful and how horrible things really are right now Whew. and I used to be so proud of You know, the concept of that if you do work hard here, you can, I'm a testament that if you work hard, you can turn your life around, you know, I'm not saying it can't happen in other countries, but people move here with that in mind and to know that there are still babies in cages that no one is talking about. We're so concerned about COVID that we forgot about these camps that kids are dying in, adults haven't had showers in 90 days, uh, no, not the proper food, no place to really relieve themselves. 
uh, the humanity of it all. It really makes you wonder what is the point? Is that you cross a line where you get too rich that you forget about motherfuckers or what? You know? I don't ever want to be so rich that I forget about the least of them. I'm embarrassed that we've separated children from their parents. I imagine how when my mom used to leave to go to work and drop me off to Sister Carol's house, who passed in 2016, the night that I performed, there's a war going on. And then the church let me have it for that. And I came back with conversation while they were running their mouth about my outfit and the performance. They don't know I was performing through grief. I had just found out that my mom's best friend had died who would raise me. Your shit goes deep, y'all. And I appreciate you being so patient. I know you got your own shit going on. I'm not trying to dump my life on y'all. I'm just trying to relate to y'all. We, mm. When my mom used to drop me off, before she would drop me off over there, she would wrap me up in this blanket. She would say, this is mama's little potato bug. And she'd wrap me up in that blanket. I just remember feeling so safe and so comforted when she wrapped me up to get ready to go over there. And um, when she would drop me off, I remember the separation anxiety. Some of y'all remember that too, being dropped off at school or kindergarten or preschool or whatever, or a babysitter or whatever. And your parents drop you off or your mom drops you off, or your dad drops you off. And when they drop you off, it feels like they're never going to come back. At that time as a kid, you don't really realize like if they don't go, they can't provide for you. And it's almost like now that my parents are gone. It's like they had to go so that I could provide for myself and be a man and be a, a quality human being in society or at least try. But I still feel that same separation anxiety sometimes. Just to be able to call them and get advice about shit, you know? Then the person you get dropped off to, just to care after a while, you know, she'd be like, you'll be all right or whatever, you know, you feel me? And then by the time I got distracted with toys and, you know, riding tricycles with Amber or something, then I'd be crying for a whole other reason. I was happy when my mom showed up to pick me up, but then I'd be sad because I didn't want to leave my friends. So I, I wanted to have it both ways, you feel me? Like I was crying when I got dropped off and then had I not been dropped off, I wouldn't discover the fun things that would make me forget that I got dropped off. So by the time it was time to leave the place, I was crying about getting dropped off too. I didn't want to leave that place. So those feelings don't leave because you're an adult. You still feel abandoned and just kind of left out here, you know? And what's good is I'm okay, you know? Like, I'm surviving, a, you know, I'm not hurting financially or anything. My ducks are in a row, my credit's popping, you know? I, I, I've done the work, you know? I faced my goliaths in that regard. I still have more to face, but I'm really proud of, of what I've made of, of myself considering the circumstances and the cards that I was dealt and it is possible, but it doesn't mean that that grieving process, there'll be days when you'll be absolutely fine and then out of nowhere, you just feel completely alone. Uh, but I, I agree with you, Peculiar84. I certainly developed a, 
a more lasting, uh, impressionable relationship with God. Uh, I didn't discover the emotional depth of God until quarantine. I, did, I only knew God for like heaven and hell or love, hate, or blessings, judgment. It's a very polarized ideology uh, that we're presented with for those of us who grew up in church. And I'm not bashing it. You know, I'm thankful for my foundation of the way I was raised because had I not had that foundation, I'm sure I would have wild out by now. Um, but there's only so far I can go with anything that I do because of that foundation. So I'm not knocking that. That's not the point. And I don't like when people take what I'm saying here and take the parts they want to make it look like that's what I'm suggesting. And it's like my country. I love my country, but I don't like the people in the leadership position doing what they're doing to bring such embarrassment and shame to what we represent. And the majority of us don't like it. It's not like the majority of us want this to happen. But the fact that 70 million motherfuckers do want it the way it is. Got a nigga shook. And the irony is these are people who say that this leader that's going out of office now is a representative of God. It makes you feel like you're in the twilight zone, especially when you're grieving, you know. It's not about my parents, but about my grandma, who I used to be very close to every day of mine. She hasn't passed away, but she was taken out, taken out for me by egocentrism and by money. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you get well. I'm well, you know, uh, I'm just human. I know how to compartmentalize my feelings. Um, the tears just mean I have love or I have, uh, there's a place in my heart that this thing means a lot to me. Not that I'm not carrying on. You should know by now I'm a very resilient, resourceful black king, but even kings, you know, they lose things, kings lose things. Kings, just trying to get up every day, go out and make sure you don't get killed as a black man. Watching other black men get killed and nothing be done about it. And then people getting arrested and beaten for saying stop killing us. Uh, on top of no stimulus, on top of. The pandemic on top of people you love contracting the disease and dying from it or being very very sick and even though they've had it and have recovered their physicality and their energy levels have never been the same since they contracted it and still having to go out workplace film sets TV sets studios COVID test after COVID test just to make a living. I'm grateful. I'm not in any way being ungrateful. God's been good to me. He's provided for me. Uh, I'm a hard worker. I'm a great listener. I'm a good friend. So when you see me express myself in this way, there was a time I would only do that through music but I feel like who I become in my abundance of what experience and wisdom and knowledge, I'm able to share those things. And it just feels good to know that even though people couldn't get to you or they weren't there for you when you first called them, that they're willing to call you back. And then here I am on my end can't talk to them because I'm trying to talk to you. So I've learned to 
try not to take things too personally when I can't get a hold of somebody or if somebody swivels in the lane on the freeway doing something stupid or someone's looking at me in an awkward way to try not to take it personal as if people just don't want to be there for me or don't want to be considerate of me but I'm not aware of something else that they might have going on. So it really balances your perspective. It comes with age. It comes with patience. Yeah, it's a decline call because now I'm, you know, talking with you guys. They'll be fine. I already spoke to them earlier, so they already know. And then the one before that would call me back and they already know. These are, I don't have many friends, but the ones I do have, they know what's up. But you guys have been my friends too. You know, I have people that are on here um, that I've never met before, but I feel like you're my friend, you know? And I appreciate y'all for allowing me these times and this experience. Thank you, Woman of Jazz. Thank you, King Riri. Thank you, Miss Leah. Thank you. My sister-in-law passed away two weeks ago. <sighs> From cancer. So I had to talk to my brother about how to navigate that as the head of his household uh, his wife's uh, sister <sighs> and how I told him you know on Thanksgiving he wanted me to reach out to my other sister-in-law to kind of encourage her. But I said, I would do that, except my close friend just died yesterday, so I'm not in an emotional state to pour anything into anyone. Meanwhile, people running their mouth and saying whatever they have to say about me and talking shit. Don't even know what the hell they're talking about. It's sickening to see how humanity is treating each other. I'm not trying to bring nobody down. I'm not trying to change the temperature of the room. I feel like Eveline when she was like, <laughs> don't bring me no more bad news. Then I feel guilty because I'm like, and here I am still here, you know, trying to have the audacity to pursue a career. But if I don't, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat, you know. Watching my friends grieve their parents, trying to be a good friend to them. So that's why Language of Tears was so important to me. I wrote that song in 1995. Not even knowing that it would be something I'd be using in the future 
as a coping mechanism. That's why it makes me want to fuck somebody up. Run in their mouth. You don't know what niggas is going through. You be trying to wish you was in their shoes. And you don't know what niggas is going through. That's why you gotta have more compassion. Yeah, I wrote Believer from Out the Box in 1994. I wrote Work on Me in 1995. I wrote Trust Theory in 1995. You know, I was just a church musician at the time. I would just write these songs. I was just trying to make dope offering music. Back then, they didn't pass no damn plate around. Offering time was like fashion show time. Like whatever outfits you had on, you walk around. You know, yeah, you give them to the Lord, but if you had a fresh outfit on, nigga, you better believe, or your hair was just cut, or you had a nice hairstyle, whatever. That was your time to stretch your stuff, you feel me? (laughs) And sashay away. I remember looking forward to Easter because I wasn't even thinking about Jesus dying on the cross. I was thinking about that new Miami Vice looking outfit that was about to slay these niggas. (laughs) Priorities all wrong, you know. uh, I can laugh about it now. I remember my dad didn't want me to wear this particular outfit before he was a pastor. This is when we still had home church. And I wanted to wear, I was like 10, and I wanted to wear this, you know, Miami Vice, you know, Don Johnson type vibe, skinny tie, you know, big coach, sleeves rolled up, whatever. I was fresh, man. I was super fresh. My dad did not want me to wear it. He was so concerned about what other people thought about me. But my grandfather, who passed away in March of 2004, um, my dad passed away July 2004. So back then when I was 10, it was my grandfather who vouched for me. It was kind of like my representation. It was like, let him express himself. <laughs> uh, he really fought for me to be able to really express myself. I was very clear about fashion and what I wanted to look like and how I wanted to present myself very young, always. Yeah, that Philip Michael Thomas look, you know what it is. And um, I just remember my grandfather standing up for me and how good it felt to have someone who stood up for my creativity in the face of religiosity. When I walked up to that front row, because like all the older homies that played drums or you know were musicians or whatever was over there, they had their outfits on or whatever. But that was the first Easter that my outfit as a kid smashed all of their outfits. I was not thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection. I was not thinking about Jesus getting up early one Sunday morning. As a matter of fact. I used to hate Easter sunrise service. Open confession is good for the soul. Some of y'all ain't gonna say it, but I never understood why I gotta get up early. Jesus got up early already, so why do I need to get up early to tell him thank you? He knows I thank him. I'm gonna thank him all day today. It's gonna be an all day siege plus dinner plus night service. It's just, I'm sorry, please don't judge me, you guys. I'm just. (laughs) I'm just trying to keep it real with y'all, you feel me? <laughs> I love y'all, man. You you pull it out of me, you know? <laughs> you make me feel safe. <laughs> uh, I'm grateful. It wasn't like I'm upset about it or nothing, but at the time, I just was like, maybe on Thanksgiving, we'd have to do early Thanksgiving breakfast service I don't know what they called it but I just knew 
you couldn't really enjoy your Saturdays back then because you already knew you had an all day siege on Sunday. But I can't front like there's nothing like hearing like is on ninety two point five FM X H R M FM Chicano Baja California Mexico X H R M had the gospel playing on FM and you be getting ready for church and there was this feeling like the whole process of getting ready from like the socks to you know you putting on this and you you know I wasn't shaving then but you know just getting your hair together or brushing your teeth or putting on that outfit while you're hearing this you know really good gospel music it puts you in the mood almost like when you put on certain music to get ready to go to the club and you have that pregame where you turn up before you even get to the club so you already turn and uh, I just remember when it wasn't Easter it wasn't Thanksgiving it was normal times to get ready for church that was a very exciting time for me and um, <laughs> hot comb for the girls <laughs> Uh, and then after a certain hour, then they, that gospel station would turn back into the ratchet stuff. But some of the stuff like Tremaine Hawkins and the Clark sisters would still end up afterwards. And I just remember pastors and preachers and church people really having the problem with the gospel being played after two o'clock on Sundays. Because that meant the station turned back into regular programming. And I was always the one thinking... I would like to be on the station that comes on after two, but seeing what I'm seeing, but the production be so good that they couldn't deny it. So we don't have that anymore. And I just want to say shout out to Tremaine Hawkins for that fall down song that ended up in the clubs and number one on the charts. She took a lot of heat for that. Um, Vicky Mac Latayad was one of the people who, regardless of what was going on, knew how to like still put out artists who were edgy that had pop or crossover appeal. And she would tell me when she used to work at Sparrow Records and you know working for Tremaine back then, just how much grief that people would give her. She just wore nail polish, you know. I just and so my best, not best friend, but super close friend. He's, I wouldn't call Troy a best friend. He was like a good, close friend, confidant. Sometimes you have your bestie, but then you also have these confidants that get your humor, get your failure, get your anxieties and things. And he worked uh, at the beginning with Vicky McLatayya at Gospel Centric Records and when Kirk was first getting, getting put on before he became Kirk, Kirk Franklin. Um, he was a part of making sure artists like Kirk Franklin or Tremaine or these different people that crossed over could cross over and survive the attacks of, you know, I guess evangelicals or fundamentalists or just really super, super starchy church people's opinions about creativity. So thank you, Troy, and thank you, Vicky Mack. Thank y'all for that. Thank you, Clark Sisters, for taking whatever darts you took so that in BB and CC, you know, these different ones were the ones who gave me the courage to use my creativity uh, for the kingdom. So. <sighs> I just miss all of that. I miss how that feels. I don't miss the the hamster wheel part of it. I don't miss that part. I don't miss the the rigmarole of it, but I am thankful because it did keep me out of trouble. You understand what I'm saying? It kept me out of trouble. I got in trouble, but not that kind of trouble, okay? And it was because of the way I was raised. I had no idea I was being raised for a time such as this. Accepting leadership means to me the good, the bad, and the ugly 
you guys are going to be involved in. That's the type of leader I've always been. I would like to thank Lily and Lloyd. She's been a very, very, very good sister and friend to me. She was there when I found out Sister Carl had died. She was there when Edwin died. Always comforting me, making sure I find out the information not through social media, but you know, making sure I was okay anytime someone pass or there's some type of news like that. Lily and Lloyd has been a great source of inspiration to me and comfort to me. She's been a really good person. John P. Key, I spoke with him tonight. That's a brother and a father to me. Lost all that weight, looking great. He told me I look good. He could be saying something like, man, I need you to go see, you know, <laughs> you, you need to go to rehab or something. You know, he could have been saying some, some stuff like that to me, you know, but he could see that, you know, in spite of all the, the grief we all are experiencing, that I'm experiencing personally during this time. He's like, you working? I'm like, no, 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 I'm just uh, on a grieving vacation where I took a vacation specifically just to, to grieve, to face the music. And it's been healthy for me. And you guys have been there every step of the way. I'm just upset that there are people who take my lives and screen record them and exploit them without my permission. Let me decide how it's gonna be distributed. And if I wanted it distributed, I would have put it up myself. So why take it upon yourself? And then, you know, just so you can get, I, I just, I'm still upset about that. I don't like that. I don't appreciate it. Just ask. Such feelings are too frequently reinforced by society in which we live. Death provokes its own reactions in those around us. And those reactions in turn intensify our vulnerabilities and fears. We may feel feared by others or shunned but when we need to recognize that even though through death cause though death causes us indescribable hurt it makes us different from those who have not suffered loss we must not be ashamed of death eventually it will touch our lives at some point there's many people who act like they're immune to it now you know they'll look at me and say why would you go live going through this thing? Because I don't want to go through it alone, number one. And I've built a relationship with my audience, my friends, followers, slayers, where we trust each other. Yes, I will pray for you. Um, I am Priyana 8. Thank you, Sh Shakli. <sighs> Father, thank you for all things this time that we're sharing, getting through a very tumultuous, tempestuous time in the world right now. And uh, Brianna has just asked for prayer. Father, even in our affliction, cause the spirit of God to rise up and above, even that to facilitate the needs as a servant to your people, as a friend to your people, Whatever she's facing right now, or feeling, or contemplating right now, 
give her peace of mind and know that she's not alone and that there are random people she doesn't even know that have all collectively come together to cover her, restore her, pray for her, love on her, give her strength and comfort and peace in this time. She asks for prayer openly, Lord bless her openly for asking openly, doubly. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, people always judge and go against things they don't understand. If someone expresses themselves a certain way and they aren't open to trusting their own feelings, they bash it. This is true. God has not forgotten about you. He sees you and this didn't catch him by surprise. Continue to be great no matter what perspectives are out there about you. Easier said than done because I do ignore most of the stuff, but some things still get to me. So I have to tell people that mean well, that call themselves defending me or they're upset about something someone said to me. It's best if I don't know. Uh, my day will be going fine and somebody in, you know, anger or defense be like, I can't believe this so-and-so did this. You want me to blah, blah, blah. like, nah. You know, but I will remember all those who said if I need them to handle something, that they'll handle it for me. And I will use that card if I need it. I will. But I don't use those cards just for fun. You know, I only use that if I absolutely need it. But I will pull that card if I do. I believe in you and the God in you. Thank you very much. Well, you are welcome, Rihanna. Definitely, we got you. I love you, B, and will forever cover you in prayer, even as you pray for others. Thank you. I love you, too. Because if he said that he would do it, it will come to pass. God is not for God. <laughs> Facts. It's true. And you're human, and you're loved by us. I can feel it. And I'm honored to be your friend. While I may feel as if I have lost a physical part of myself because of death, or I may be suffering from the stigma of death or feeling disgraced by death, I will recognize that these are unrealistic and temporary reactions. That's so true. I will focus on myself as the whole, complete person I have been and will always be. That's good. The loss of my loved one has deeply affected me. It's true. And it has. But I will give myself time to heal, keeping faith in my return to wholeness. This is another situation that happens when you're dealing with death. It says, I won't go to meetings or parties or even to the gas station. I think some people who I used to get invitations from, sometimes even my best friends, you know, before I go anywhere, I'll be like, hey, so this is a great idea about this party or this get together or this gathering or whatever. This is pre-COVID days, of course. I'd be like, Who's the cast? Who's been casted in this party? In other words, who's going to be there? Because when you have experienced as much death and loss as I have, when you do decide to come out of the house to go put yourself in an environment with people who only know you for the success they think you have or the celebrity they think you have or the abilities they think you have or even my personality. I'm lots of fun. Anyone who knows me, I'm silly nuts. Y'all know me. I'm letting more of that side show now, but those who have known me know that that ain't nothing new. It's new to y'all how crazy I am. But I've been a nut, you know? I've, I've been crazy. You know, that's a little nonsense now and then is relished by the wisest of men. Willy Wonka. You don't want to go to meetings. You don't want to go to parties. You don't even want to go to the gas station. 
grief is a very anti-social state, and I would have to agree with that. A father remarked that before the death of his son, he used to leave his house to run errands a lot. He'd stop, talk to his neighbor on the corner. He was involved in community affairs. He attended a lot of meetings once a week. He'd enjoy going out to dinner with his wife. On the weekends, they often went camping with other couples. But after the loss of his child, his behavior changed. He didn't feel sociable at all. And because his business was in his home, he found it easier to become reclusive. This is so true. He said, I don't want to leave home now unless I have to. And most times I make sure that I don't have to. Um, I'm not sure if you know how much your resilience has encouraged others, but it has. Some of us just have the rough side of the mountain. Wow. If you could describe this current moment with a song, what song would it be? Language of Tears. Definitely Language of Tears. Hello, Nina, never ending. You, you are everything to me. <laughs> oh. Ah, God, Nina, I love you so much, yo. Uh, all survivors tend to avoid gatherings. So I said that to say that I feel like sometimes my best friends or people who were trying to get me out the house was like, they didn't know how to really deal or how to be a good friend to me because I oftentimes didn't want to, in the middle of a good time, just suddenly just feel sad or just look uninterested because even though people are trying to go on and have fun and things, it's still like it's hard to have present fun when your present state of mind is so altered by the the gravity of the information you receive or the gravity of the amount of loss that you've had. So you're not alone in feeling anti-social. Um, that I'm only anti-social now because of COVID. I just like my own company, you know, but this is me trying to be transparent even the more with y'all so I can get over and pass some of these feelings of isolating myself because as soon as I express myself some of y'all saw like you got sites taking pieces of it and trying to make a story out of it or trying to bring attention to their brand at my pain's expense and I guess it's just the way of the world as someone who is mildly famous I'm nowhere near as, you know, like a Cardi B, Kardashian, you know, Kanye type person. A lot of people know me, but not to that degree. I'm grateful for that. But this is why I see why a lot of celebrities end up either very recluse or very removed from the scene because the moment you do try to show that humanity, somebody takes advantage of that for their own gain. And it's repulsive, you know. It's not that what I was saying last night couldn't help somebody else in a different audience, but because I know that folks can't handle that part because they, and then they use my my old, I know when it's wrong, when they start tagging people like Lexi and calling me Tone and things of that nature because you want to attract the people that like that type of garbage. So... Thank you guys for allowing me a safe space and not exploiting me. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, Millie, 1992, she says, yes, I felt like that today because I don't want to hurt anyone with my energy. And that's all it was. You know, it's y'all may be celebrating by them gifts for your parents and eating and laughing and you know and it's just like damn I used to have a couple of those you know I used to have parents I used to have those so even though you're trying to be happy for those who still have theirs 
you know, you do your best because, you know, everyone doesn't have their parents living. It's impossible. It's just generationally speaking, it's just not possible. This is not how the circle of life works. And I'm aware of that, you know. Um, however, I don't want to bring anybody else's vibration down. I don't want to change the thermostat of the room. But I'm trying to connect because I can't hug y'all. You know, I can't even go over to my best friend's house to hug him. I can't do any of that. You guys can't hug your family the way you normally do when you're going through a crisis or if you're going through grief. Sometimes just a hug can solve everything, you know, for that moment. It may not solve the problem, but it does help with the navigation of the initial feeling of the emotions that you're contemplating at that time and I'm around people more and more who are losing more and more and I just want you to know I'm not above it I just don't want it exploited I don't want it respected well if you want to respect it then you should just keep it private well if I keep it private then there's a chance that I might go down a rabbit hole or feel so isolated that I just I'm not able to talk it out well maybe you should see a grief counselor no because then the grief counselor ends up getting counseled by me because I have so much wisdom and knowledge in it that they end up crying and pouring their hearts out to me which I'm hey I'm thankful for that great quality to have but the way I came by getting that degree the way I came by getting that understanding diploma has not been an easy walk. And I'm so grateful to be a strong African-American black king. The ancestors are in my blood. I got the prayers that have went on from my grandparents and parents that still go on to this day covering me. I got a couple bodyguards, goodness and mercy, they've been following me <laughs> all the days of my life, everywhere I go. It's just one of those things we're going to have to walk through together. Hmm. Grief is antisocial and it's okay to pull away from into our individual privacies as we work towards resolving our loss. Avoiding public gatherings is a natural reaction and one that may last as long as a year. It's true. I remember even though I was putting out music in 2010, I really wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't dealing with everyone because it wasn't just like the public that it turned on me. You know, I had family that turned on me. I had really close friends that I was cool with to stop talking to me. So in addition to already feeling antisocial, I also had a betrayal thing. Like I didn't know who was around me that I thought had my best interest. Now listen, I don't need no damn yes men, you know what I mean? But I also don't need people who are intentionally trying to uh, like for example, people will call themselves liking me and stuff. And one of the first things they'll say is, you know, I don't care nothing about your celebrity. I'm just into Anthony. First of all, you don't know Anthony. You haven't met Anthony. You don't know him. You don't you don't really know me like that. And the fact that you dismiss see, the whole reason why you're trying to talk to me partially is not just because I look good. I know I look good. When you go through shit, you look good on the other end. When you go through fire, you come out popping. You know what I mean? So I get that. But I didn't always look like this. I didn't always have this type of gravity. I didn't always have this type of openness in the sense of I was open through my music, but you guys didn't get to see this side. So people will try to like dismiss or make light of the things you've accomplished. And that's one of the most unattractive things you could do because I'm not saying you gotta be all like excited that you talking to me, but do you know how many thousands of people be trying to like get it? So don't dismiss my accomplishments just to say that you want to relate to me on a level outside of my ability. Um, 
if anything, um, if someone's with me, I don't really talk about the stuff. My friends, we don't even talk about music industry, really. Very rarely. Me and Troy very rarely talked about music industry stuff. You know, my friends, sometimes, but not really. Um, because that I do that all day. You know, if I'm trying to be romantic or, you know, trying to date or, or trying to, you know, someone's trying to court me or I'm trying to court them, whatever you call it, you know, the first thing you do is you try to, like, move straight to Anthony as if we have that type of relationship, that's immediate turn off to me. Um, a super turn off. I know Lady Gaga's name is Stephanie, but I don't know Stephanie. I don't have a history with Stephanie. I have not been given permission to call her that as a friend. Brad Cooper has that permission. She established that with him. That's why he calls her that. I'm sure. I'm sure that they have a, they have a rapport, they have a, uh, a relationship that she feels comfortable uh, calling, him calling her Stephanie, but even me, even though I'm be slayed, when I would be at a Gaga rehearsal or invited to one to just be a support and observant, watching her genius, I didn't walk over to her. What's up, Stephanie? I don't care about nothing that you've accomplished as Gaga. I'm here to meet the real Stephanie. That's so disrespectful. And there's a lot of... Let's just say it happens often. Uh, happens often. And it's annoying. You would love to be able to try things or date people or Especially when you're grieving. It's like, well, maybe I can just go out on a date or something. Or maybe I can just... Use this time to talk about something else outside of loss all the time. And maybe try to find some type of love. <laughs> but when you're grieving... Uh, your discernment kicks up so high. You can see through people's intentions. And I hate the fact that I have to use so much discernment just to f find the possibility of that type of love. I don't have to accept invitations from well-meaning friends if I don't want to, and I don't. I can politely decline without feeling guilty. I don't feel guilty. I don't have to make up excuses. I don't make up excuses. I can just say I will be unable to attend. I have a right to withdraw for a period of time until I feel more comfortable being around others. Or here's the other part that would happen, like, Say I finally did give in and say yes, right? Um, you know, I wouldn't be in the space of love during grief, but I do sometimes want the company or a change of environment, but those environments are not available to me right now. It's still super isolating. Sometimes you finally take people up on the offer to go out. This is pre-COVID. You go, you know, to their house or go to the gathering or go to the, the club. I used to get invited to the clubs all the time. And, you know, they'd have bottle service for me. I wouldn't have to pay or nothing like that. I have my little VIP and got my drinks or whatever, my people, whatever like that. That was kind of like a church in its, in its own right. But then people who know that you're going through grief will bring up grief when you went there to not think about grief. And I'm not sure if they think they're trying to be mindful or I don't think they mean it in a malicious way, but you told me to come out. So don't bring up, Hey, are you okay? And start doing that circular altar call rub on my back or how are you doing? How, like, don't start trying to, you know, doctor feel me right now. You know, like you don't know what it took for me to get here, you know? So I'm here. 
I'm actually in good spirits. I wasn't thinking about anything related to death. But here you are. Now you're bringing it up. And now I got to go back into that while I'm at the club. Or while I'm at this gathering. Trying to have a good time. You said you wanted me to come there. But now you're trying to pry me into an emotional state. So it's just like. I'm I'm not here for that. <laughs> I was fine. If I if I found the strength to put the clothes on and, and 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 come to this function, then I'm good. Hey, uh what's up, Scott? Um I have really, really good friends. You know, and they understand me. My real friends know me. We don't have to talk every day. We don't have to if that's that's not the point. Whenever we link back up, they know we just pick up where we leave off and there's no judgment. You know, when you're grieving, you'll have people be like, well, I ain't heard from you and I don't know when. And you're like, and I ain't heard from you and I don't know when. I didn't, I figured you was grinding and you was hustling and you was, you know, you're trying to make that money, you're trying to get that bag. Like, I'm not mad at that. We'll, we're not, you know, kids. It's nothing personal, but we'll reconvene, um, at the appropriate time, you know, and when it is, it's, it's, it's no judgment or you should have, you know, it's no Tony Braxton. Love should have brought you home back night. Love should have brought you home last night vibes. You know, it's just, Hey, what's up? We just pick up where we leave off. That's, those are the types of friendship situations I enjoy the most because it gives me the liberty to whether I feel like it or not, I'm not judged by how often I speak to someone, how often I see someone. I appreciate those friendships. I want to be with people to let go of the hurt, but I think I've forgotten how, and it's been a year. That's, that's real talk. Outside of our private envelopes of pain, Life light torches, sing songs, beckons with all of its senses, senses to draw us out. We must eventually open and take part. And this is true. So part of my opening up as a person is, has been showing, you know, the public my ups and downs. You know, it was usually through music, but it was never on such a intimate uh, level as it is right now, is how I'm approaching it now with you guys. Uh, it's taken time. But I think the pandemic has, has opened me up because now I know people are just as susceptible and vulnerable as I am because we're all in the same boat no matter what level of success we may find ourselves in at the time, at this time. So, uh, I just appreciate having this outlet tonight. Just talking, knowing somebody else is there on the other end that feels somewhat similar to how I feel or has experienced something along the same lines is, is a great comfort. The nausea has dissipated. It may come back, but for the time being, just having this interaction with some some version of human exchange and compassion and understanding, hopefully on my end, is back to you it also gives you that same feeling of uh, I feel comfortable or I'm comforted now at least for the time being you know after a period of painful isolation which may have been all encompassing and prolonged it is necessary to test the waters in the world outside this means venturing out for at least a short time to watch or take part in some activity that we once enjoyed the hard part about this quarantine is that the things I would normally do to deal with those things, I was talking about this last night in that grief live about Magic Mountain, Six Flags, you know, Disneyland on the East Coast. I think uh, Disney World is open or whatever. But there was a time I had my choice, you know, and when I moved to L.A., that was part of the reason because I used to have to drive from San Diego to those places. And now with just in a matter of, you know, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes in any, any direction, I could get to uh, one of these places or maybe more than 20 minutes going to Disneyland. But the other two, it's, it's, 
it was something that was a go-to. It was the easy go-to. Some days I would just go there every day of the week with my platinum pass and just get inspired by the creativity or get ideas about my own, you know, someday amusement park for the public and contemplate thoughts or just get my head out of a really crazy headspace with amusement. But I don't have those outlets anymore. At least temporarily, I hope. I don't have those anymore. So to have you guys um, listening, responding, praying, loving, me being in a place where I can share these emotions, it took a long time to get there. If we live alone, we can begin asking a friend to meet us for coffee or to talk so we can catch up on each other's lives, even though we may find it much easier to remain withdrawn. It is crucial for us to try to venture out. Emerging from our envelope of pain, even for a moment, means risking our emotional safety. Wait a minute, how is, am I reading the never-ending story? How did it know that I was at that part of my life? Emerging from our envelope of pain, even for a moment, means risking our emotional safety and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. We may say we can't, we may say we don't want to, or we're afraid to risk it. We've been isolated for so long that we don't remember the solid certainty of putting one step after another, of trusting that we can set out and that we can arrive, but we can do it. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't get swarmed going to amusement parks. Only, you know, most people don't. I'm at a place, well, I don't know how much longer that's going to last. Probably not much longer. I'm normally spotted at like malls and um, the grocery store quite often. <laughs> that's where I'm, you know sometimes rest restaurants but most people you know I'll go to a restaurant one time I walked to this restaurant and I saw Johnny Gill and he was you know out on a date or whatever and even though we cool I knew it just didn't seem it was just a coincidence that we chose the same restaurant it didn't mean that I had to go speak to him and get all in whatever he had going on because we're cool I just knew he was there and acknowledge that I'm like well I'm here for the same reason some food and privacy and you know let me respect that I would love someone to respect that about me but then someone else noticed who I was and came over and immediately um, you know they wanted a picture or whatever which was fine because I wasn't eating they weren't interrupting my meal was after all of that and it was cool but going to amusement parks are very rarely get spotted like that or swarmed in that way. I'm grateful for that. And then the times where I, I did go through those type of things for a while, I uh, would just make sure I went to the movies at a time where everybody else is at work or I'll go to the grocery store when I know most people are at work. Or now that I have the COVID mask, <laughs> it's, it's with the exception of my big ass head and my you know, my eyes are the dead giveaway because when I, my eyes are just, watch out. <laughs> Some people can still tell it's me, but for the most part, the mask lets me kind of, I've experienced the world in a, in a more pedestrian way because no one knew it was me. So in many ways, having to wear the mask has given me a lease on life to do normal things. It's true. Emerging from our envelope of pain even for a moment, risking our emotional safety and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. We may say we can't. I already did that part. We might be a little unsteady at first when we're trying to step out and, and get back involved with life again. But eventually we will become sure of ourselves and will benefit from those things in life that beckon to us.
We may be surprised by the lack of understanding shown to us by someone we had always considered to be one of our closest friends. We want desperately for that person to know how we feel or to give us the type of verbal responses we need or to comfort us in ways that we value the most. But instead, this person in whom we had so much faith seems not to understand us at all. And I've had this happen. Like, there's been times I've reached out to people because I was really having a meltdown and they just weren't available. Just like, you know, I'm not available sometimes. This person in whom we had such faith seems not to understand us. This creates in us a loneliness, the loneliness that comes from facing something difficult without the help of a person that we would choose as an ally, a supporter, and a helper. When this happens, we may make the situation worse by repeatedly trying to explain what we feel, or we grow weary of hoping that the person will suddenly catch on to our grief. We need to make the whole situation easier on ourselves by reducing our expectations when we see that person, by not trying to establish an emotional or psychological link. That's great. It wastes our energy. We need to surround ourselves with those who can understand, even if they only relatively understand, such as those we meet in a survivor's support group. So me talking to you guys, for those of you who have experienced loss similar or of any kind, or we're, uh, have the common dilemma that we're facing now, I feel like the slayers and the people who are watching, you you are my support group. I am your support group, which is why I don't want these types of sessions exploited in that way. You know, I don't want it used for some type of, you know, tabloid fodder or for, for you to gain subscribers at my expense or our experiences expense. I will drop my expectations that are not being fulfilled. I will not continue to set myself up by being in the presence of someone who, is not under, who does not understand what I'm, I'm going through. Such experiences only intensify my loneliness. Damn, that's so true. I need to recognize when a person's capacity for understanding is not sufficient and I should not waste my energy on trying to establish a connection. Later, when I feel better, I will look at this relationship. I will be evaluated in light of what I have needed and what I have given and what I have received. This was also me. It says, I'm not the type of person or kind of person who tells my troubles to someone else. <sighs> Sometimes we think that if we confide in someone else, if we tell the story of our loss, we are burdening the other person with our troubles or that we're being too personal or too intimate. Trust me, it crossed my mind after the lie from last night got put on people's pages without even asking me, could you share that? Even though this is a, uh, a public forum and anyone can come in and watch and screen record and do whatever they want, whatever. Some people take that and use it and take advantage of that vulnerability. It takes a lot of courage for someone who a lot of people know to speak this way. It's especially these days, but I'm rolling the dice on the fact that we have a long running relationship. The people who have followed me for all these years and who I have been friends to that I've only met on here. So I feel somewhat safe because I keep seeing some of the same names pop up consistently. And I just appreciate y'all being there, you know? So Yo, when you said, has anyone checked up on Aiken? I cried because she was my favorite Sunday best winner ever. It's true. You don't even hear anyone mention her name. It's just very odd. Um, I wonder if this is the way I'll be treated for the rest of my life. Why can't somebody give us a list of things everybody thinks and nobody says? You do have that list. I write those songs. I share my shit. The social part of being a survivor is difficult. Facts. It would be so much easier if we had some sort of guide to get us through the confusing times when we're trying to sort out what someone says or see behind what someone says to he or she or she really thinks or wants. 
we we are talked to by some people in ways that seem irrelevant and insincere. More, more often than not, yes, we listen to claims of their devotion to us or their understanding of our situation, but what they say lacks conviction. Absolutely. We want clarity, we want honesty, and we want support. I know you do. I know I do. We don't want meaningless conversations that are composed of false messages. Like, for example, B. Slade, a.k.a. Tone, finally responds to the Daryl Walls incident. That's not true. That is not what last night's live was about. It came up in the live because folks just keep on throwing me in his situation as if I have something to do with it. I don't. And my situation isn't even his situation. It's not the same. So it came up in in a, a portion of the overall live, but it, that wasn't a response to that. I didn't get on here to do that. that. I'm not that type of person. I don't do that. I only get on and say something if they're trying to get me riled up in something that I didn't ask to be thrown into. I don't appreciate that. I keep bringing it up because I don't like it. Um, it would be uh, so much easier if we had some sort of guide to get us through the confusing times of when we're trying to sort out what someone says or see behind what someone says or what they really want or what they think. We're talked to by some people in ways that seem irrelevant and insincere. We listen to claims of their devotion to us or their lack of understanding or our situation, but what they say lacks conviction. We want clarity, honesty, and support. We don't want meaningless conversations that are composed of false messages. These mixed social exchanges are the result of the lack of experience on the part of others and their general reluctance to confront the uncomfortable. In cultures where death is accepted like an expected part of life, there is a less need for people to try to mask their feelings about death and about survival needs and situations. We can help ourselves by understanding this. Once we have worked through the worst of our grief, we will be in a position to educate others <laughs> regarding loss and I'm not just reading this from a book. I'm telling you from experience. That's what the vibes are. When we, when our personal energy merges with the correct opportunity, we may want to work to improve the conditions for survivors in our community. This can be done most successfully through the support services and grief-related organizations. It's almost like you got to go through these things and try not to take them personally because in the end, that experience that, that I went through you know, since, God, it seems like since 2000, 2004 is when like this, I don't want to say death spiral, but it just seemed like so much death over and over and over again for people I really care about, you feel me? So 2020 is a year that has surpassed and trumped the worst year of my life uh, for many of us on so many levels. So hopefully us having these honest moments with each other and allowing me the space to share and relate to you could maybe somehow in some small way maybe keep you present and keep you on a more positive path and a path where you feel understood and that you are not by yourself in a situation like this because it does get very lonely especially when you're on quarantine and separated from people who would normally help you uh, navigate these types of situations um, someone said it was about grief and nothing else, but that, but that people need to stop, um, stirring up. Yes. People need to stop stirring up. Absolutely. People are so messy. I personally hate drama. Why can't we just be good to one another for once? I agree. Jesus is King 37. I'm trying to work on being better at being a, a better man in general. Part of me becoming a better man was because of death, because of bereavement. A lot of my compassion came from failure. A lot of it. A lot of my compassion came from failure. My patience. Um, 
I'm sorry I'm not whatever people think I'm supposed to be. I really am. That's not my intention. I can only be what I can be that day at that time going through those things. I'm just like you. I really am. You know? It's kind of like how people who know someone just took a shit walk after them or come near where that the offense happened and just be like, Ooh, oh my God, oh my God. We've all done it. But so what does yours smell like? Because, you know, these days now there's B.I. poo and all that stuff where you can spray and all this kind of stuff and put this lather on top of the water and it keeps the smell down. So, you know, I get all that, but it's that notion, the messiness of it is, is people acting so shocked about shit, that shit. That's aggy. That's super aggy. It's a process we all have to go through. Me and Chance had that relationship. I don't know how this works, but I take him out and I watch him shit. And then when I have to take a shit, he comes in and watches me. So I'm like, is this what this nigga feels like when I'm taking him out, watching him go through his process? And so he comes in and watches me. And I mean, faithfully, I used to kick him out, but I was just like, you know, if you cool, yeah, I'm cool, you know, but it's almost like he's letting me know that, hey, we see these parts of ourselves, and I love you regardless in any state that you are in, you know, we forget that celebrities need deodorant and have to brush their teeth and need showers and get bubble gut sometimes. Uh, we forget that um, people of prominence uh, go through embarrassing situations. I was in one situation where I thought I was showing up for to smash somebody and that's not what they had in mind at all. So I felt very embarrassed because you know, the way I guess I assumed the thing was going to go down based off of the exchange that, you know, I was about to smash. So I was just like, yikes, when, you know, <laughs> they're looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so that's not what this is. Very embarrassing. They were cool with it. We, you know, we laugh about it now, but I, I go through those awkward moments too. You know what I mean? Uh, we're so much alike, but yet we act like we don't understand each other. And, um, but we totally get it, you know, <sighs> awkward. <laughs> or those awkward moments when, you know, you think that you're in the st same standing with someone and you reach out to them to try to rekindle something but then they're like either not responsive or you know they don't get back to you like they used to and then when they finally do you think it's in the same place it was only to find out that they done they're with somebody else now and that's also a awkward feeling <laughs> I've been on awful dates before I've been nervous you know because I want to make a great impression 
You know, people, people, people forget like those same feelings that you guys get. It, it's the it's it's no different because I make good music or a lot of people are familiar with me or a lot of people know about me. It's no different from the same vibes that y'all get. You know, it's just. You want to be understood. You you want to be, you want to feel like you're a part of some type of community that you're not just out here by yourself, you know. And I'm the type of nigga that's like, I can be around a hundred people. I can hear the applause of ten thousand people, but I still want that one person to be proud of me, you know. I don't want to be exploited, you know. Hey, I want to be naughty too sometimes, but I don't want that shit ending up on the shade room, you know? I want some type of privacy, you know? I have wants and needs. I want to be loved too. I want, I want, you know, I want sex just like the next person, you know? And especially when you're really stressed out or grieving, man, it's just like the opportunities just seem to present themselves that much more, but, you know, then you have to think about, hey, is this person going to take this experience and use it against me? You know, or what if things don't work out between us? Is this person going to, you know, say something unattractive <laughs> about me? You know what I'm saying? Like those same concerns that you guys have are, are that much more exacerbated when you're in a position with a platform. But the same feelings of loneliness and despondency or nervousness or if you get excited because you like somebody or you're really excited about going out with someone or the, the, the prospect of being with someone, those feelings of excitement of butterflies and things of that nature, it's, it's no different. It's no different, you know. It's the same. And can you imagine if you want to allow that space? And if you want to allow this platform to safely exchange ideas and if I'm going through grief or a loss or I'm concerned about what's going on in the world or I'm dealing with, I have a heavy burden on me today from just being a black man out here trying to make a living. Um, Yes, I do surround myself with good people. I don't have anyone in my direct inner circle I, I curate my energy. My friends know it's very difficult to get in with me. A Taurus period is just not going to let anyone in. It takes a long time for a Taurus to let somebody in. Because I'm observing everything about you. Because once I say I'm your friend, I'm really going to be your friend. You know? I'm a good friend. I want comfort. More than anything, I just want comfort right now. Meaning, I want just the foods I like and the places I like to go. I would at least like to be able to do that to get through this part. Or put some money on my damn account. Pelosi. And, uh, what's his name? Turtle. McConnell. What is that nigga's problem? So y'all got all this money and all these salaries and three and four hundred thousand dollars and y'all good. So you can take your time and go on Christmas vacation and Thanksgiving vacation while the rest of us out here struggling. You know. I'm personally not struggling, so I don't want to present to you that I'm in some dire situation. I'm not, but I know people that do that are very close to me. I know the people who are on here I'm representing or speaking on behalf of people who are struggling or don't know how they're going to survive. It's very frustrating watching privileged people take their time with your survival. When you add that with the grief and trying to feel comforted and loved and understood 
it's quite a difficult task to navigate, you know? Yeah. Hopefully as we develop this relationship together and we continue to grow, because I don't want anyone following me that's just here to cause problems. If you don't fuck with me, then why are you here? You know, maybe I'm just not your cup of tea right now. So just scram, you know, beat it. Hit the road, Jack. But for the ones who are feeling what a nigga's saying, that do have been on this trip with me, even if you just join and this resonates with you, just know you're not just following someone with some talent or gift or insight. You're following someone that is just like you. I'm just like you, I promise. I am. I may be, you know, somewhat of a geek, a science nerd. I like documentaries. I like the process more than the product. Um, I watch a lot of weird stuff that would be weird to other people, but I find very intriguing and very interesting. So with as much swag as I've developed over the years just by getting more self-confidence as a man and as a black man, uh, there's still those times where you just, you know, that human awkwardness. But I've come to find that that type of awkwardness can be very appealing, attractive, not so much maybe for some in a romantic way, but it's really just re more of a refreshing vibe. You know, I want to be if I am going to be followed and I do have a platform, I want to be one of the ones that whoever is following me, they'd be like, wow, like I've never had someone I felt this close to that I don't even know. But that's how I feel about so many of you that, I've, that we've been friends online forever, but we've never met. But I still feel like we're besties. <laughs> I still feel like we're really, really good friends and you know, we've grown together. You know, I'm not the same guy I was just, you know, when I first started touring with Patty LaBelle, I was not this nigga. I promise you. Those of you who have been following that long know, like, I've evolved a great deal this year. This was, even though this is a hard time and whatnot, like, me being put on time out like the rest of us has done my personal development a great favor. And I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of you. I appreciate you all walking forward, even though we don't know where we're going. But by faith, we're just continuing forward and pressing forward, sharing ideas, sharing experiences. Um, I just need feel like you live with no regrets, as we all should. Yes. No regrets. I bungee jump, you know, I really do. Uh, I'm just, it's not even a settled thing. It's just a, a, a confidence thing where, you know, in this society, we all want that validation. We want someone to know that we're good at what we do, you know, like that we're really serious about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And, but we're also silly and have friends and family that we're worried about that end up getting cancer and end up diabetes and heart conditions, like life still happens. I just want you to know, like I go through that shit too. I feel y'all, you know, I'm so glad that you guys were here, that I was here for you and that you were here for me. Like it's, it's making us closer, even though we can't, hug or be around each other my appreciation level for these 52 people that are up this late rocking with me nobody wants to feel like they're alone you're in a you're in a chat room you know with like-minded individuals you know sharing a common vision <laughs> pushing toward a world <laughs> to rid of color lines. Maybe that's why I like Rhythm Nation and Janet so much. It's not so much I'm just specifically a Janet fan of everything she does for the most part, yes. But that's not why. 
It was really a nation. That collective or a community of people that are thinking about the same thing that really do want to see racism wiped out through music and dance and art and acting and poetry. I know it sounds hokey. I know a song can't change the world, but it changed my life. It made me want to be an artist. Had it not been for that record and Janet, I would not be the man I've become. So I feel y'all like I'd be like, when y'all feeling funny, I'm feeling funny with you. Like, I want you to know, like, I vibe y'all. Like, when I'm making music or if I'm writing or whatever it is that I'm doing, even this, I'm doing it with you guys in mind, thinking, man, this might make them feel good or this might get them inspired or this might make them laugh or this might make them, no matter what side I'm presenting, I'm, it's, it is with you guys in mind. It really is. And, uh, so it's a great honor to each day that I'm spending time going through this grief vacation publicly with you guys, yet privately. I feel like this is our circle. This is our private situation, even though I know anyone could tune in and look and do whatever they want with it. I, I wish I could have more control over it, but, you know, you can't, but. I am much better, you know, each day. And all you can do is take one day at a time because who knows, tomorrow we wake up and we find out that money doesn't work anymore. You know, people have lived through Great Depression, y'all. The economy has crashed more than once. We've experienced pandemics before, y'all. The next three months, I don't want to make you worry, but I would be less of a friend if I didn't tell you between now and February, this is going to be one hell of a ride. I mean, the best of things happening and the worst of things happening simultaneously. If my grief lives, me sharing this with you doesn't quite resonate with you yet, it is highly probable, unfortunately, it is highly probable that you will understand what I'm going through in the next three months. And when you do, just know number one, God will be there. He will never forsake you. And I will do my best to be there, a friend and a servant. I don't mind being a leader. It's not a grave task. It's not an inconvenience. It is an honor. And I finally accepted that but it was only through grief. We have to lock arms and walk through this together because we're gonna need each other these next three months. I'm so sorry for those of you who have lost, but do your best Do your best. It's hard, like, when you're doing your best and people don't think it's good enough. When you're trying to be a decent human being and people are still trying to label you as something that you're not. That's hard. I know what being misunderstood feels like, but I like being misunderstood in many ways. I happen to like it that way because then that way only the people who want to actually do the work and spend the emotional time and investment to really get to know me, that's their reward and my reward for discovering new things about them and becoming a better friend or a better uncle or a better cousin or a better brother, you know? 
I have a whole lot of stuff to sort through, but I can't sort through it until I sort through my own shit because I don't want to dump my stuff on anyone, you know? I want to be able to just share freely and do my best. And I'm, I'm happy with this process, process. Because we are all being promoted in a way that it's just not the conventional promotion. Maybe there was there's an, a, an inner accomplishment or graduation that's taking place in all of us. Maybe you don't feel it quite yet, but for most of us who have been going through this since March, we've gotten better at production. We've gotten better with our mixing. We look better. Our physicality is better. You might have picked up weight, but that's to be expected. You know, don't sit around judging yourself about it just if you really want to change it change it if you don't feel like changing it you are within your means and well within your right to not have the desire or discipline to do no such thing i know that might sound like awful advice to people who are in the you know fitness industry but these are unprecedented times y'all just swear it's going to be an easy transfer of power we're all praying that it is. But we know who we're dealing with. We're going to need each other. Lynette, 14, you said that this helps you because you lost your father. We understand. And even if we don't understand, we can have compassion you guys have it with me. Everyone is so brave to be kind enough to help one another in this way. Just just knowing someone's on the other end relating to you is a great it's a great comfort. Hey, thank you, woman of jazz. That just gave me a great idea. That's why I love you so much. You let me be myself. You're always encouraging me. Always proud of my creativity. I dig that about you. I really dig that. I think that's an awesome quality to have. That you consistently are saying something positive and real in my life on the jazz that has not gone unnoticed you just gave me a great idea too All the best. I don't know how I'd make it without you. <laughs> Three keys and I challenge you to a game of horses. A game of horses. Mm. I really appreciate y'all. Um, I'll check back in with you. I'll be praying for you. I'll be thinking of you. Tonight when I go to bed, you know, I'll be thinking about you guys. And when you close your eyes tonight, just know there's somebody around who really cares. Okay? 
just hang in there, kid. You're a lot stronger than you look. God help us all. I'm hugging now. Remember when Monique used to have her show? And she, um, she used to be like, hug yourself, tell yourself, you know, you love yourself. That was my favorite part of the show. I didn't care who the guest was. I just wanted to see her hug herself. Y'all owe her an apology, too. Shout out to Tisha Campbell and Christina Arnold for an amazing hosting job. So send these boys, all the performers. Thank you for getting us through. Thank you. Um, PJ Morton. Uh, I don't know if you see this or not, but you're a genius. And I'm so proud of you. And just love, love what you do, man. I just appreciate your honesty. How you love your wife and all that stuff. And just thank you. Rob Milton, thank you for believing in me. I appreciate it. 